pleasure of having uh, Marlene Kretschmer. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly, but it's very hard. <laughs> so she's um, a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Reading in the Department of Meteorology. And she's applying uh, causal inference uh, methods uh, to study the large scale drivers of precipitation in uh, seasonal forecast models over the Mediterranean. And before she did her PhD at Boston, also working on causal inference and uh, teleconnections. And today she's gonna talk about uh, causal inference and causal discovery in climate science. Um, so thank you again, Marlene, for joining and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so yeah, before starting, um, I'd like us to acknowledge a few co-authors, um, one of the people who worked um, on, the, on the main work of this talk um, together with me on this. So this is uh, Chad Shepard, my supervisor, and then also Elena Sajoro, also from, from Reading, and Alberto Arribas, Rachel Pratton, Mai Robinson, and Sam Adams um, from the Met Office Informatics Lab, or who used to be at the Met Office Informatics Lab. Kind of to, um, so I know it, or oh, Carlos told me this is kind of an also interdisciplinary audience. Um, so yeah, if, if something is unclear, you can, I guess, always interrupt me or we can discuss at the end of the talk. But um, yeah, I try to kind of um, make this a talk both for climate scientists, but also for um, computer scientists or machine learning people. So kind of to, to set the scene, this is an XKCD comic I like a lot, which I think shows kind of the challenge of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work or also of applying machine learning in climate science. So it's um, three scientists talking and they say, uh, our field has been struggling with this problem for years. And then, well, I suppose it's a um, machine learning person comes and say, struggle no more, I'm here to solve it with algorithms. And after six months, um, well, he um, then figures out that, wow, this problem is actually really hard, which is, of course, not so surprising to the, to the domain scientist. And again, I, I kind of, I think this is basically my talk in a nutshell. So kind of the, the difficulties or the, um, the need to, um, just, or to work together on these kind of really hard challenges. Um, motivation of, let's say, one of the challenges uh, I'm addressing or try to address is these um, different, or you, you see here these different um, um, prediction time scales. So you see this gray arrow, which goes from weather forecasting, so this short term forecast um, up to climate projections. And in between, we have this um, sub seasonal to seasonal and these decadal predictions, as well, I know many of you at DLC work on. And this is also called the prediction desert. So um, predictions on these time scales um, are not very skillfully and also where well, there is it's really it's really hard on this um, make predictions on these time scales and where well, one of the reasons is also that um, it's really kind of in between this initial value problems and boundary condition problems so um, one needs different yeah kind of techniques to um, achieve progress on on this time scale um, but one thing we know let's say and this is basically also kind of the, the main part of my work is that um, that an improved understanding of these so-called Taylor connections is really key to reduce, but also to communicate the uncertainties about these regional weather and climate projections on this S2S, but also on these longer term climate um, forecasts. And um, Taylor connections are basically um, kind of links in the climate system with some remote forcing, such as, for example, some remote climate patterns um, for example, something like ENSO or the MJO, but also monsoon activity. Um, this kind of has can have an effect on regional weather and climate around the globe. And again, you, you see just very schematically outline a few of these um, important um, climate patterns, which are known to um, um, lead to enhanced predictability in, in the mid-latitudes, for instance, on these S2S timescales. And kind of in understanding these interactions and these different contributions really important to uh, make these better forecasts. So kind of um, typical basic questions um, raised in this context are, for example, um, the question to understand how much um, ENSO, which is one of the most important of these Taylor connections, how much um, this ENSO um, contributes to, for example, temperature variability in a particular region, or we might be interested in particular processes driving precipitation um, in Europe, for instance. 
So um, um, kind of the, let's say the data challenge or the, the mathematical challenge is to extract these information about these particular contributions or this causal information from the data. Um, so <laughs> this is, um, I call this a non-exhaustive Venn diagram of data science. So we have our data science toolbox, let's say, to answer these questions and to work with our climate data. And then machine learning and deep learning are, of course, um, very powerful and um, to especially to classify spatial temper um, patterns. But um, they have not, let's say, particularly been designed to answer causal questions. So what I'm kind of um, advocating here today is the concept of causal inference, um, which is related to machine learning, but it's um, it's not, let's say, a complete overlap or it's not a subset of machine learning. Um, so the, the main part of this talk is on causal inference and, and causal inference is basically yeah, kind of a mathematical concept of the statistical framework to quantify causal effects from data. And then I will briefly talk about um, causal discovery, which is uh, more on this intersection. And causal discovery, the, the, the task is to, to learn causal structures from data. So it's two different things. And um, during my PhD, I've been actually mostly been working on causal discovery. Um, lately, I'm, um, yeah, I'm very much thinking about different possibilities of um, causal inference. But it's, it's, let's say, it's related and it comes both from this causal universe. Um, so before starting, um, I just want to highlight um, or to read out two quotes from two famous people. So both won the, um, the Turing Award, so you know, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. And the first one is from Judah Pearl, who's kind of the, the pioneer of um, causality research. And he wrote, recently wrote this popular book, The Book of Why, which actually also inspired much of this um, work here from this talk. And in an interview, he said that um, deep learning, I see they're all stuck on the level of association, curve fitting. So no matter how skillfully you man manipulate the data, it's still a curve fitting exercise, albeit complex and non-trivial. And this obviously um, annoyed a lot of people. Um, well, I guess one of them being um, Jan Lecon, who is, I think, the chief uh, scientist or AI scientist from, from Facebook, but also professor at NYU. And he said that um, sometimes people have accurate models of a phenomenon without any intuitive explanation or causation. So sometimes requiring explainability is counterproductive. And well, I'm not saying, um, well, one, of, one is right and the other one is wrong. They're obviously two very um, intelligent um, persons. So, but I do think that this, um, yeah, these two quotes are interesting just to say that there's actually not really a consensus about, let's say, the, re the relevance of causality in, in deep learning. And, um, and given, let's say, all of this recent uh, hype or this recent boost of machine learning and deep learning, um, I'm kind of here, uh, yeah, advocating the, the causality approach or the causality aspects of it, um, kind of, well, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously or I'm very much excited about deep learning as well. Um, I think, um, yeah, I'm just taking here the side of causality in this talk. Uh, okay, so part, part one is about cause inference, and so it's about this quantifying cause effects from data. And I'd like first to come back to um, this term teleconnection again. So for the um, well, so I found this striking, but so this is the, the official AMS definition of a teleconnection. Um, so it's defined as a significant correlation and widely separated points. And the name refers to the fact that such correlations suggest that information is propagating. Uh, we are all trained uh, with kind of um, the mantra that correlation does not imply causation. So I find this um, yeah, striking. So, and I think it shows kind of this problem that there is a gap between the physical understanding of teleconnection, which is causal, so something uh, happens and then there is an effect somewhere else. And the, descript the statistical description of this, which is actually often just purely correlational um, and, and not really, let's say, process oriented. So the main task is how can we kind of reconcile correlations with causations, and this is this concept of causality in statistics is basically about. So how this is defined is that, um, yeah, quite intuitively, that one says that X causes Y if intervening in X while keeping everything else in the world fixed will change uh, Y. 
And this kind of interventions are mathematically expressed with this do operator. So this is the probability of doing, uh, doing X and this will change the outcome um, of Y. Uh, often this kind of do operation is maybe just a thought experiment, but it's um, important to make, let's say, this difference. Um, this is, yeah, becomes very obvious if we kind of uh, consider this case. Let's say we have uh, data um, of um, pressure at some location, and then we also have data of the barome uh, barometer, um, X and Y. Then obviously if we intervene in Y, this will not change X. So if we, um, if we intervene in the barometer, we just move the needle by hand, this will not change the pressure in our location. So why is, um, um, because we know this because Y is not a cause of X, but if we intervene in X, if we change the pressure in our location, this will of course also change or lead to changes in Y. Um, and we, again, this is because X is a driver of Y in this case. So cause inference is really kind of about um, predicting the effect of an intervention, so from the kind of do operator, from the data, so without actually doing the intervention. And um, this example kind of shows already that this is only possible if we have some knowledge about the, 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 the mechanism or the processes which generated our data. If we have some causal knowledge um, there, then we can actually make these um, causal conclusions. Um, just a toy example. So let's assume we have, again, we have um, data of X and Y. Um, let's say for the moment, we don't know what these processes or what these data represent. Um, and if we were um, asking, a, um, or we can see that they are correlated, there, there's a statistical association. Um, and, but if we ask what happens to Y, if we would intervene in X, so if we, for example, changed uh, X to, or if we set X to um, X equals one, what would happen? So what we interested here in this kind of context um, is that we're interested in this intervention or condition distribution. So the um, of Y after doing X, but um, with our usual tools, we can just um, compute the observational condition distribution. So we know what the association is. So we can see kind of in these past of the data we have, we can see uh, how Y looked like when X was one. Um, but again, we know that these things are usually not the same or they're not always the same. If you just think again of the case uh, with um, the pressure and the barometer. So again, this the answer kind of answer these um, questions about interventions or about causal effects is only possible if we have um, causal knowledge available. So when we uh, have our expert knowledge, for example, when we know that X is driving Y, just as in the pressure barometer case, then we could um, estimate or we could quantify the effect from the data. In this case, we would know we could, for example, if we assume a linearity, we could just um, make a linear regression and um, quantify the effect. And then we could also answer these causal questions and predict the effect of intervention. In this case, this would actually look like this. So um, yeah, the first key point is really, um, if we have causal knowledge, we can, there's actually a lot we can do. If we don't have any causal knowledge or hypothesis, um, then we can also not answer these causal questions, but we are stuck to this level of association. Um, well, this is, let's say, not too magical. We do this all the time in climate science, and I will just in the following give a few examples of um, prominent um, teleconnection um, examples and um, with also real world data. So this is using reanalysis data, observation data. And kind of, I try to show how we, um, by combining, um, let's say, scientific theory um, with um, um, with data, how this can actually we are able to make uh, strong statements and actually things we already do, kind of intuitively, but let's say not in a very systematic way. So this first example that of a common driver effect. So um, assume we have or we have data from precipitation in summer in Denmark and the Mediterranean, and we also have um, data of um, the North Atlantic Oscillation, um, which is kind of describes the position of the storm tracks in the North Atlantic. So we see that um, precipitation data in these two regions are significantly correlated of minus 0 0.25, um, but um, let's say just from all the climate scientists in the room, they probably agree that this is not causal because we just know that precipitation in these regions depends on the position of the, the storm tracks as for example, expressed by the NAO. So, and indeed we can of course also test this um, and we can, if we regress out the effect, 
um, of the NAO. So we calculate the partial correlation condition on NAO, then the correlation basically drops to zero. So this is, let's say, consistent. So the data is, we interpret the data and it's consistent with the, the with things we know about the system. Um, similarly, we can also estimate the causal effects. And in this case, again, we assume the, the, um, the effect or the relationship is linear. And um, we also assume that there are no further, let's say, common driver effects or kind of confounders. Then we can simply um, quantify the effect of the NAO by um, regressing the not precipitation on the NAO, but also on um, and do the same for Mediterranean and quantify um, the standardized causal effects like this, which are both around 0.5. Um, what's also important here is um, that we can, and I think this is something which is not often done, we can also um, uh, use this kind of causal knowledge to um, understand or explain the association we found at the beginning. And this is just like a very simple thing which follows from these um, so-called path uh, tracing rules um, that of course, if um, the reason we had this causal relation in the beginning, it was because of the common driver. So we can also predict the correlation based on these causal effects. So the, um, the um, correlation is just the product of um, the causal effects. And actually this adds here up really nicely. And so we, um, yeah, again, this is a simple, ex very trivial example, but it kind of shows how we can use knowledge combined with data to um, understand the data. A similar case is, is the following. So we might be interested in and quantifying the effect of ENSO and on, uh, on California precipitation. Um, so on the right, you see kind of, uh, again, what we call the causal network. So we kind of schematically show how, um, how these things are, are linked. So ENSO, we know ENSO drives um, um, the position of the jet stream, which then drives or is um, causing changes in um, California precipitation. So, um, but what one often does, um, one just puts all the different, uh, if we were interested in quantifying the different contributions, um, what is often done is just using different climate indices um, and kind of a multivariate, uh, multivariate linear regression framework. And if we would do this here, so we regress California precipitation and so and um, the jet stream, then actually the regression coefficient of ENSO is zero. And this is of course not represented of its, of its causal effect. So what happened here is by kind of, by including jet as well in the regression, um, in the linear case, including something in, a re in the regression is the same as regressing out its effect or blocking its, this pathway. So by including JET, we kind of blocked the pathway from ENSO to California. So um, that's why we get this um, regression coefficient zero. So it basically um, shows us that, um, that the kind of causal model we intuitively had in mind, so as the one on the right, um, kind of that um, JET fully mediates the effect of ENSO as actually um, a reasonable assumption. So, but if we're interested in, in kind of in these causal estimates, then the correct way is just very simple. We can just directly regress um, ENSO on California precipitation, uh, sorry, other way around. And uh, or we could actually do the same again along the pathway. So we could quantify the effect of ENSO on JET and of um, JET on California precipitation and then the product along the pathway is the same as um, the cause effect by estimating it directly. So just another very simple case, but again, showing that just including something in the regression is um, can actually be harmful if one is interested in these, in these causal contributions, what we often are in the context of um, teleconnections and predictions. Um, the last of these kind of simple examples is um, that of indirect and direct effects, um, kind of combining the the previous two examples. So this shows again um, um, ENSO, um, so the near southern oscillation, but um, here we consider the effect um, on the southern hemisphere. So we know that ENSO affects um, also the jet stream in the southern hemisphere, but it's also known to affect the SPV, so which stands here for the stratospheric polar vortex. And the SPV um, also affects the position of the jet stream. So we have these, these two pathways, how ENSO affects the jet. Um, if we're interested in the total effect, this is easy to estimate. There are no confounding factors based on our, let's say, um, on our knowledge, um, which we show here in this network. Um, so we can just quantify the effect, which is here found uh, to be 0 0.14. But often we might actually be interested in the, in the, um, in the, um, how strong the different pathways, how, how important the different pathways are. 
So we could also quantify the direct um, tropospheric pathway. Um, to do this, we would have kind of to block um, the pathway via SPV. Again, this is the same blocking this pathway is just the same as including SPV in the regression model. So we can find the effect of, of ENSO here. And then we could also quantify this indirect um, pathway via the stratosphere. This is, uh, we can just estimate the or quantify the effect of ENSO on SPV. Um, and we can also quantify the effect on SPV on Z. For the latter, again, we have to account for this common under set of ENSO um, and um, yeah, come up with this estimate. And then the indirect stratosphere pathway, the strength is again, just the, the product along the pathway. And in total, you see that the sum of the two pathways is exactly the same as um, the total effect, which we estimated in the beginning. Again, this is just this very nice uh, property of, of linear models. So um, yeah, yeah. again, another, another simple like, case. So um, um, one could argue, let's say, that all of these things um, climate scientists are already doing. And we, we might sometimes, let's say, um, condition on the wrong ones, but uh, the wrong confounding factors or common drivers. Um, but all in all, there, there's nothing new here. So where does the causality or where is the, um, the need of, of causal networks and the causality framework? And I think, that, or I hope, I hope the next example kind of shows that um, one does need um, such a framework. So in this case, um, we're interested in the influence of of sea ice on the polar vortex. So I, I circled this, um, or this series right circle. So it's Burns cover sea ice uh, loss, um, which is um, hypothesized to influence the polar vortex in the stratosphere, this time again, the Northern hemisphere. And uh, what we did in this paper, which um, recently appeared, um, this is quite a yeah, controversial debate. So what we first did, we, was, we tried to summarize all the different pathways, all the different confounding factors, which kind of might bias these um, estimates. And I won't go into detail here, but you can see that this is quite complicated. Um, by, let's say, writing down our assumptions, our hypothesis in a causal network, this obviously, um, yeah, strongly simplifies um, this approach. So we can um, quite easily communicate, let's say, what, what we think is going on or what kind of how the physical mechanisms look like, which generate the data we, we observe. And then um, we can use these um, causal inference rules, which kind of tells us which um, of, the, um, of the processes we have to condition on or we have to regress out in order to come up with this estimate. Um, and it turns out we don't have to condition on everything, but we just have to kind of um, find the, the ones which, uh, the, let's say, the clever um, um, processes which kind of block all the different um, pathways. And so in this case, kind of, um, I refer to the paper here for more details, but in this case, can, uh, case to quantify the effect from Ben's Carosia is in autumn to the polar vortex in winter, it turned out actually just be enough to condition on Ural sea level pressure in autumn, which is known to be a driver of sea ice loss, but which also is, um, can affect the polar vortex. And kind of all the effects from ENSO or from North Pacific sea level pressure are um, assumed to be um, captured by this. Um, well, not too much to relate to this um, causal um, framework, but I want to uh, highlight this here. So in kind of in this paper, we um, we did some different sensitivity tests or um, to quantify these um, this pathway to the stratosphere. And we did this um, actually in the historical SEMA pipeline, so not just the observations, to quantify this telecognition pathway um, in the SEMA 5 models. Um, to first of all check um, if it is kept or if it's um, yeah, supported by the models. And uh, we actually found um, that the mean causal effect is only very small. So it's um, maybe only just in the order of 0 0.05. But we then kind of, um, given that we have some um, yeah, trust that this is actually represents some kind of uh, causal estimate, we can then go on and kind of derive different implications for future polar vortex changes based on these causal estimates. Um, but again, I just refer to the, to the paper here. Or oh, we can also, of course, discuss this after the talk. A uh, final example, this is a paper not uh, where I'm not involved, but uh, which I think uh, what I like. It's not related to teleconnections, but it's actually um, from Hild et al, who use a similar or the same causal um, framework um, to 
to understand or to quantify um, the role of uh, model resolution in this case for impact um, its impact on convective initialization. So it's um, more on the um, NWP context. So they also they kind of um, yeah showed all the different hypotheses, all the different potential pathways. Um, and then quantified them and then ident identified kind of the dominant one, um, how resolution might play a role in this, in this model bias. So kind of to summarize these, um, the steps of causal inference, which I, I talked about, um, I also like to call this knowledge guided statistics. Um, if you think of the discussion from the beginning, so kind of the first step is always to to use our, the expert knowledge uh, we have or the domain knowledge to kind of set up a plausible causal model. So um, of course there can be uncertainties around this and we can also play with different models, but kind of first say what we think um, the mechanisms look like which generate our data. Then as a second step, we can, let's say, draw these logical implications and test if the data actually support them. So if the data we have is consistent with what we think is happening. And for example, in this case, we would expect that uh, U and V are um, correlated or there's some statistic association because they're both driven by X. But once we condition X, um, the correlation or the association should disappear again. In, in the linear case, we could just um, calculate the partial correlation condition on X. If we find them um, not to be uncorrelated, then, then we have to, of course, to check our, or let's say the first step of this analysis. And then finally, we can use these cause and inference rules to estimate um, cause effects from the data. And um, let's say cause inference or the, gives us the tool, uh, gives us the, um, yeah, the, the toolbox to decide on which processes we have to uh, condition. Usually it's on sm um, small dimensions sent up, it's, it's quite easy. And uh, we can just see this from the graph, but there are actually several different rules um, of um, how one, how one what, when and how one can isolate these causal effects. In this case, for example, if we're interested in the effect of X on Y, there's just one pathway by U, but there's also this common driver uh, that we would have to account for. So the linear case, it's just including in the regression. Um, so I, yeah, get these few simple examples, but I think or the point is more that if we have, um, yeah, more robust causal estimates, let's say beyond those very pure B varied um, correlations, there's called, yeah, many possibilities. And what we can do, um, for example, regarding bias corrections, uh, predicting changes, linear models, and so on. Um, I spend the next few minutes, maybe five to 10 minutes, to briefly talk about the second part on um, causal discovery, which I said was um, what I did mostly during my PhD, which is more on this intersection with um, machine learning. So um, the aim of causal discovery is to learn causal structures. So actually the status that we have these different, or as input, we have time series data. Um, again, the time series representing different physical processes or different um, field connections or different yeah, climate patterns. Um, again, and our task is that we um, are interested in finding this, this causal structure between um, these different processes. And well, I told you before that this is impossible if we don't have any causal knowledge available. Um, so I'm saying there are actually possibilities, but of course they require some assumptions. But of course, uh, one good thing is um, when we also when we work with time series that we know that the um, effect should come after the cause, so um, we can use this information. And then there are different um, algorithms of or causal discovery algorithms. I've been working with the so-called PCMCI algorithm. Um, where, which is, let's say, based or rooted on these principles of, of causal inference, so of these ideas that we can have common drivers or mediators and how this will uh, look like. Um, but we then, exp um, we then kind of try to learn this statistically. So one could, again, using the, just referring to the linear case, one could um, calculate partial correlations if one is interested, if there is a link from A to B, and then iterate for different combinations. And based on these, um, let's say, um, yeah, in kind of an optimized way, it trades through these different con uh, combinations of conditions to learn the causal um, graph um, structure. And this um, algorithm has, or um, I yeah, should refer to a former colleague, Jakob Funge here, who's really the pioneer in this, and he has adapted um, yeah, this kind of algorithm um, 
also to kind of deal really with particular particular characteristics of climate data, such as strong autocorrelation. And we have also a few papers on, um, yeah, to expand this even more. For a recent paper led by by Elena Sajoro on um, to deal with also or to learn on the regime dependencies and so on. So there's really a lot of uh, going on, but of course it's. Um, yeah, it's let's say a more explorative approach, but it's um, yeah rooted in these same um, principles of of cause and effect and the statistical um, description of it. Um, one example of a paper which is actually um, which is in revision, but it's uh, down to minor revision, so it should appear soon. This is on um, a pretty distant uh, of uh, marine cold air outbreaks over the Barents Sea. So what uh, Julia did here was um, with this. An algorithm to kind of learn different of the causal structure of different um, hypothesized drivers, and then she could use these drivers um, to actually to um, for kind of a hybrid um, forecast approach to subsample ensemble members to achieve high prediction skill. This is just one example of what one can do if one knows um, causal drivers. Um, kind of a yeah final link or to um, to link this more to machine learning. Um, um, yeah, kind of a natural um, question or yeah, next step is to say that assume okay we 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 can go from time series to causal graphs or to causal structures. Um, what if we don't even know what the relevant time series are? So what if we want to learn A B C D first? So um, as input we just have our gridded climate data, and we are interested in um, learning the causal structure at least let's say of one process we. We have maybe in mind, and so this is of course I think something where um, machine learning is helpful. So we can um, kind of classify patterns from the data and go from credit data to um, to machine learning. Uh, sorry, to time series, and then um, let's say put on our causal discovery machinery. And we have a simple um, or one paper or yeah, with a few applications already out how to do this, um, where we actually extract patterns just on and correlated or significant correlated regions. And where we, let's say, for a target variable, where we learn the, um, the relevant time series or the relevant uh, regions first, and then learn the causal, um, the causal precursors from them. And um, this is um, a few recent papers where this had been applied. Um, this was, for example, applied to learn drivers of the Indian summer monsoon of hurricane activity in the model crop yield. And what I always highlight here is that even though this was, let's say, um, really like a learning task, so going from gridded climate data to these um, statistical prediction models, um, the really key ingredient was, of course, also domain knowledge and this causal knowledge, um, because, of course, we did select um, relevant timescales, relevant variables, and so on. And this is, of course, something um, one always does in when analyzing climate data, that one makes kind of these implicit choices about um, about the data, about the timescales. Um, and again, I think, uh, yeah, this kind of causality concept is really about making these things explicit. So um, come to the summary of this talk. So in the first, first talk, uh, sorry, first part, I talked about cause and inference, about this um, yeah, science to quantify cause effects from data. And again, the main expertise is really key because one has to explicitly build it in and this then in the form of um, setting this causal network and this then guides the data analysis. And um, well, overall, this is, I think, an easy and also very traceable approach to quantify teleconnection pathway, um, pathways, even just using much, um, multiple linear regression as I did here today. But of course, this is not limited to a linear cases. One could also quantify and um, the links um, using um, non-linear non methods. Um, and of course, if we quantify these links, this of course opens many possibilities such as uh, bias adjustment. And then secondly, I, I shortly talked about causal discovery. So this is about learning causal structures from data. So this is um, to some or also based on um, additional assumptions, this is um, possible to, to some extent. Um, so I think causal discovery um, algorithms can also help to kind of close off some knowledge gaps and to test different hypotheses. And I think especially in combination um, this is powerful, for example, if we um, let the causal discovery algorithm not learn everything about 
um, our um, question um, or our research questions, but maybe the parts and time scales we are um, not so sure about. So I think, yeah, that combination, this is probably even, even better or even um, more relevant. Um, this is now really my, my, my final slide. So I'd like um, kind of an outlook or maybe to uh, open this for further discussions. Um, come back to this XKCD comic and really, again, make the case that I think, or for me, causal networks or this kind of framework is really a way to reconcile this physics with um, data science. And given that we are so interested in or that one of the key uh, challenges is really to um, including physics and in, in machine learning and kind of this knowledge guided or physics guided machine learning, I think. Uh, we shouldn't forget about all the different possibilities um, causality research offers. For example, I think it could be key to just build these fully interpretable machine learning models, which um, are especially relevant for high stake decision making, um, where we also need uh, trust in our methods and models. And so, yeah, there is really a rich literature on cause inference actually, and also many applications in, in medicine and epidemiology. But so far, there are very few applications to climate science problems. And also, I let's say, I don't know all the different possibilities yet. So I think it, um, or I hope there are more people um, seeing or believing in this potential and to kind of translate all this um, literatures and all these methods, which are already out there, kind of translate them to our climate science problems and climate science data, which of course comes with different particular challenges compared to psychology for example. And then uh, lately, well, just to highlight, and this is also, again, this is not my area of expertise, but things um, well, well, I'm excited about and um, studying or collaborating with others is kind of combining um, this causality research with machine learning, deep learning. So for example, to quantify causal effects beyond just um, linear regression. Um, this is of course also cutting as a, a research topic and many people are working on this. It's also <laughs> challenging, but again, especially if we think about um, interpretable machine learning and, and trust and um, predicting interventions, I think this is an exciting area. So yeah, and this was really the last slide. So thank you. And I hope there are questions. Thank you a lot, Marlen, for this great talk. So um, does anyone have any question for Marlen? Um, I can start with one um, to open the discussion. So you, you mentioned um, that um, the application of machine learning and deep learning together with causal inference is still a very open area of research. What are the challenges in bringing nonlinearity to the uh, to the to the, the equations that you want to uh, explain um, in terms of the technical challenges that you might face? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not even sure if I can fully answer it. <laughs> um, I think. Um, well, let's say I can. I have a few references. I think where where this should be better discussed, but. Um, let's say I didn't really, or really, let's say, touch the surface about these different criteria about how, which condition or which um, nodes in the network to condition on to kind of isolate or extract these um, causal effects. And there are different criteria. One of them is um, um, the backrock criteria. This is kind of, yeah, conditioning on all the, on the driver effects one can sim uh, simply think of. And I think there is already, or this, there, I think there are some. Um, applications already where this can be estimated with uh, machine learning. I think when this comes to more complicated setups, um, this come up then this do calculation, I think there are limits at the moment or there are um, the recent papers. Um, I also know, for example, that there are some kind of um, random forest applications or kind of which is kind of causal decision trees where this can be used. So, um, yeah. I think there, are, let's say, there is a lot of out there, but I couldn't just, um, yeah, boil it down to one particular mm -hmm. change. Yeah, I was thinking, for example, in terms of uh, um, uh, defining the partial um, dependence, uh, how does that change mm -hmm. if we include 
non-linearities in our associations. But yeah, um, we will uh, we will dig into this. I imagine yeah. during yeah. The, <laughs> your stay. Uh, so does anyone else have any question for Marlene? Uh, yeah. yeah. Can I? Run? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. First of all, uh, that was a great talk, a very interesting uh, topic, and yeah. It was a nice presentation. So um, yeah, um, well, it's it's sort of more like a not exactly on uh, your talk, but more on thinking on a, the kind of research that I've been interesting for the last few years. I'm a PhD uh, student at the UPC, and I'm working currently working at the BSc. And um, it's uh, well, basically, what I've been working on is to study the causal effects from. Uh, from wildfires uh, using satellite remote sensing data and synthetic controls. And uh, well, we, it's basically a quasi-experimental setup where we're trying to study these uh, causal effects. So I, I was wondering whether you could like resemble that kind of like quasi-experimental settings with this kind of data that you're using. And like, instead of uh, drawing causal diagrams, which of course I, I could probably do it, but I, when I try to do it always, I always end up with a big diagram with like many factors, everything is linked and it's like very hard to separate things. So like what's, what, what will be your advice or like your takeaway from all the work that you've done, which is amazing. Yeah, I think it might disappoint you, but I actually, I would start with drawing causal diagrams. I yeah, find yeah. it extremely helpful and I think, um, well, I, for me, it's really just a, a way to structure ideas and hypotheses and kind of test them in a very systematic way um, and making all these different assumptions explicit. And I think in the process of where well, the second advice, let's say just from my um, experience so far with working with causality is start as low dimensional as possible and then grow uh, or let the network grow because I think even if one has like just three, four different variables, it's so it gets quickly so messy and so complicated because we have all these different feedback loops and we have different um, timescales of interaction. So it's of course never as ideal as let's say in these very in this first three examples where this is based on seasonal data and where things add up nicely. So it's usually more messy and it needs more sensitivity tests and it needs different tests of different timescales. Uh, and so on. And there's also not this very clear um, knowledge already there. So I think I, well, personally, because let's say I like the interpreting part more of being able to interpret things, I would start as low dimensional as possible and then get more complex. But of course, this is also a bit opposite, I'd say, about typical deep learning approaches where one has a lot of data and the more the better. And then one first has results well, simply put, I know, um, and then interpret them. So, but I think it's two angles and a trade-off, but um, if the question is really explicit about a particular effect of the particular drivers, I personally prefer um, yeah, having a simple network and then make it bigger or more explorative maybe with other methods. Great, thank you very much. I do have one, one, one question. Actually, a couple of them. Uh, so thank you, Marlene. It was very interesting. So then given that today's approach to use is to use statistical tests of conditional independence, uh, so using observational data, then to constrain your causal graph. Um, so how does the, the limited sample uh, size of, of observational data and, and data noise and uncertainty affect the, the conditional independence test um, and how, for example, the incorrect assumptions in the initial displosible causal model also affects your causal inference? Um, well, I guess you mostly refer to the causal discovery part um, because this is, of course, based on statistical tests and simple um, statistical significance tests. And they are one can then mathematically show that for these given assumptions and assuming infinite um, amount of data, the, the algorithm converges to the correct graph, but we, of course we don't have um, infinite uh, data or we have incomplete um, samples of effects. So it, let's say, simply put it affects in the same way as it would with just correlation. So um, if 
the data is um, yeah, not completely sample, then it can you can it can lead to wrong inferences. Um, this is for the cause of discovery part. For the other part, for the cause inference part, where we let's say start with our knowledge and then quantify the effects, um, I don't think that a simple or statistic, statistical significance testing is any relevant. We are interested in, in quantifying causal effects, and that kind of course the same is then that of course there if we have limited sample size and there may be also the non-stationarities, um, then our estimate will not be perfect. So that's why we can use models or need longer time series. But um, then let's say statistical significance testing is not um, to kind of to decide if a link is there or not. We already said we believe the link is there and we just test within our typical mathematical um, frameworks uh, how strong this link is and we can ideally then also put confidence intervals on this. So I think it's really yeah more of another question of um, how much do I trust this, this um, quantification estimate or how much do I trust is the link or this correlation appearing by chance um, if it were not there, which would be the typical null hypothesis kind of setup. Okay. So my second question was about, uh, do you have a references in mind for um, that studies that have used deep learning to distill large scale graded data to extract this time series that you, so time series with meaningful uh, causal variables that you could use, That's, this is for the causal discovery part? So um, again, the, the papers I presented, they were not deep learning based, they were really simple um, correlation based extraction. Um, I think they're actually exciting deep learning based papers out, which um, could be combined with causality. So I'm, for example, excited about um, explainable AI approaches. And um, so, for example, work done by um, in Colorado by the Lippi Barnes group, they use explainable AI to extract um, regions of relevance um, for a particular target variable. And I think this could, for example, be a first step um, to combine this then with causality methods. And I'm actually um, well, starting to collaborate with people from Explainable AI and try to convince them that they um, apply their approaches to climate data. But I think, um, well, for example, using the framework of Explainable AI or this LRP method in particular, um, I think, oh, well, this is, again, this is, um, people can, of course, or might disagree on this, but I find it hard to, um, yeah, to believe how one could, uh, let's say, knowledge about which is extracted purely based on, on deep learning methods, if we don't include any causality tools at all, um, to something where we, let's say, learn something new, where it's not just about finding ENSO again, but we, when it's really about learning something new, I, I wonder how one can, yeah, cross-validate these findings with our, um, let's say the physical knowledge we already have and to kind of, um, to kind of connect this uh, again without any um, causality tools to really build physical trust in these machine learning models. Of course, when it's just about prediction skill and accuracy, um, I'm pretty sure deep learning will always um, yeah, win or will often win. Um, but I think when it comes to interpretation and kind of connecting it with um, other knowledge, yeah, I personally think it's, you kind of need the causality aspect to kind of link or to bridge these very traditional physics-based uh, people are thinking with a very explorative deep learning based um, approaches. All that at least is my, is my uh, viewpoint. Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree that uh, LRP is very limited, right, in, in what it can do. And, and I guess it's, um, so it's mostly for grid data where you have some spatial uh, information that you want to infer, right? But then my question was more about uh, where you mentioned that you have large scale grid data and you will like, and, and you usually start before P PN, uh, what is the name of the algorithm? PCMCI. <laughs> Tonight, man, I <laughs> yeah, you start from from time series, but then it would be good to distill those from large scale uh, graded data using yeah. kind of machine learning, right? So you you could do some sort of uh, classification or something to extract your your climate uh, patterns and, and and 
and, and, and yeah, meaningful time series data. And yeah, it was more about how to do that part. And I was thinking of um, that nowadays machine, um, deep learning is more about um, optimizing for the mean state. So mm -hmm. sort of autoencoding, right? Which is, and, and I, I don't think it would be that useful but then there might be some ways to come up with um, uh, specified loss functions that take into account uh, whatever you want to discover from the from the large scale grid data, or or perhaps meta learning where you are mm -hmm. not only uh, learning one um, let's say a regression type of uh, autoencoding uh, problem, but something else, right? Like like a, like a secondary um, task but then yeah i, yeah. I guess the, the there is no clear reference um out there but i i wonder if you had something in mind about it well again not uh, particular and i think especially because, well exactly because there's so well both is new let's say um deep learning is new to climate science or relatively new um and so is um yeah this whole causality aspect Again, with causal discovery, I think really the work uh, Jakob Bung is doing is probably leading the field, or he, and he also has these links a bit to um, explainable AI and deep learning, not so much uh, LRP, but another name I forgot, um, um, where they try to include this. I think there's also a reason this is so challenging and people, or let's say very clever deep learning people are uh, struggling to come up with these simple solutions. So yeah, um, I'm pretty sure I don't have the best uh, or an optimal overview of things which are possible or which could be done. I would think that especially quantif for the quantification part must be uh, useful because deep learning is just better in quantifying nonlinear dependencies and learning them. So um, I, yeah, I think there must should be something there. Personally, again, I think I, I think with LRP and kind of in this combination, this could be one pathway um, to extract or to really find new um, drivers or wind opportunity for predictions. Um, but I'm sure it's not the not the only one. Um, so yeah, and I'm sure um, actually yeah, people with more de deep learning uh, background um, can have more ideas of about what what one could do. But yeah, so but I also think they would appreciate, or I think um, if one just would talk as a climate scientist with a deep learning person that just drawing, let's say a causal diagram would already faci facilitate the, the, um, the collaboration just as a meta level, I guess. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, so I, I can ask you one more. <laughs> um, so um, you, you've talked of the benefits of um, uh, using causal uh, inference methods to interpret uh, the model and in a way to reconcile the physics with uh, the uh, statistical discovery of the data. But um, do you also have in mind some examples where including uh, causal reasoning also improves in terms of the um, for example, predict the predictions of, of the model in terms of the, the accuracy of the model. Mm -hmm. Because I imagine that that could be a case. I mean, if we actually um, are able to better represent the physics through causal relationship, maybe we also are better at uh, predicting. Yeah. yeah, sure. I think, again, if we, if we knew the causal drivers, we might be able to be the best predictors. Um, I think it's especially, uh, especially useful or obvious that it can help you or prevent your model from overfitting that you just don't yeah throw in too much and if you just let's say select other ones which uh, you don't have to include because the information is already included in another driver um because it's for example mediated right um yeah then i think the first bit is really yeah it prevents you from overfitting i think it also helps you to make um yeah, let's say more clever choices regarding statistical models. Um, one thing I'm currently working on or trying to work on is really this idea of windows of opportunity for seasonal forecasting, where we know that predictability is limited, but there are these few windows, for example, when we have an active MJO phase or when the polar vortex is um, extremely weak, um, just like last winter. 
that predictability is enhanced. And of course, this opens, I think, possibilities for, for hybrid models and statistical models. But I think without a, a causal model in mind, this is um, at least if, it, if there are more than two or three drivers um, included, I think it's um, yeah impossible to kind of derive the one. So the question is really, when do the all these different uh, March probabilities, when do they truncate in one driver? And so this is um, why I think this is most useful um, in terms of, again, interpreting and, and understanding when something physical is happening and when we have these windows of opportunity for pure predictive or in terms of your accuracy uh, metrics, um, just use all the information might of course uh, be this or be as, as, um, as possible. So I think it, will, it just come, does come with this kind of trade-off or balance between interpretability and accuracy. Mm -hmm. Right, it makes sense to me. <laughs> so uh, is there any other question for Marlene? Uh, otherwise, uh, um, uh, um, thanks again, Marlene. I want to remind everyone that uh, Marlene uh, will be a virtual visitor at the BSC in the following month. Um, so probably starting uh, in April. Uh, so if anyone is interested in collaborating with Marlene, please uh, get in touch. And thank you again, Marlene, for joining us. Um, it was a great talk and uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and I look forward to um, meet you all on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, uh, hopefully in person sometime soon. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> all right. Thank you very Bye, much everyone for coming. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you.